So I think we've got a really wonderful panel today. I'm going to just quickly introduce everybody. Um, so uh, Raj Mankans is a writer, teacher, and community organizer who has served as editor for Rice Design Alliance and a publication site and design review of Houston since 2008. Uh, previously, he was managing editor for the journal Feminist Economics. His writing has been featured in Sight, Curved, Grist, Street Blog, USA, and many more. Uh, he is a Next City Vanguard Fellow and Senior Fellow of the American uh, Leadership Forum. Uh, and sitting next to him, Giorgio, uh, introduced him earlier. Congratulations on the film. That was really wonderful. Uh, Giorgio's left is Asada Richards, uh, founding director of the Sankofa Research Institute and adjunct professor of sociology and arts leadership at the University of Houston. Uh, she received her bachelor's degree from the University of Houston, went on to earn a master's and a doctoral degree from Pennsylvania State University. Uh, she has extensive training in the quantitative and qualitative research methods and analyses, has been, invited, has been an invited speaker at many organizations, including the National Endowments of the Arts, uh, CERNA Foundation, and MIT. Uh, Mayor, uh, Mayor Sylvester Turner appointed Sada as chair to his Housing and Transition Committee in 2016, and she's the board chair of the Emancipation Economic Development Council, as well as the board chair of the newly formed Houston's uh, Community Land Trust. Um, and finally, not least, uh, Steve Radome is the founding and managing principal of Radome Capital. Uh, Radome Capital is a diversified real estate development firm based in Houston, Texas, uh, that focuses on retail, entertainment, dining, and creative office environments. Radome Capital aspires to collaborate with community, culture, and commerce in all of its products. Uh, Mr. Radome received a bachelor in business administration, and master's in public accounting from the University of Texas Business School, along with a Juris Doctor degree uh, with honors from the University of Texas School of Law. Um, so today, uh, again, thank you all for coming in and speaking with us. Um, I sort of wanted to talk about how the film relates to Houston specifically, and the development in Houston. Um, when I first when I introduced the film, uh, you know, Houston, I said that Houston is has really surpassed Chicago's third largest city, and it's, I think it's continuing to grow at a very rapid pace. Um, and a lot of where it's growing is not uh, e exactly equal uh, to the different uh, areas. Um, and specifically, you know, even though everybody always hears on all the uh, websites and all the articles written about Houston that it's you know the most diverse city. We have so much cultural heritage here, um, and yet I think that Houston is still one of the most racially segregated cities, um, both in terms of land use and housing uh, and location within the city. So uh, I just wanted to sort of open it up to everybody to get your opinions on how you know the, the the topics in the film relate to the way that Houston has been developing both in its early growth, but also in its current growth. Um. Uh, is this working? Mm -hmm. yeah. OK, so um, you can Google Houston red line map. Uh, that's a good place to start. Uh, I asked the US Library of Congress for that map from several months, and they scanned it. And, sent it to us, and um, it's now available for you to study. It's uh, archived at Fondren Library. Um, it's a map from the 1930s, and different sections of Houston are labeled. Uh, the sections that were um, predominantly African-American um, are labeled hazardous. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, um, so I did go to school here, obviously, and I grew up in Houston, but um, the history of Houston development is still something that I'm very much learning about, so I'm actually very curious to hear from you all. So. Well, I think the film really chronic chronicles the patterns of migration 
and um, and how urban cities were settled and how suburbs were settled as well. And Houston is not, is not an exception. The freeways, 288, 59, uh, really destabilized African American communities, particularly Third Ward, particularly Fifth Ward. Um, those neighborhoods were economically um, heavily impacted by what was called urban renewal at the time. And so the flight or the white flight out of urban areas and the in in line with Raj said of the red lining. And so we know that those are the patterns. I also want to pick up on something that you, you spoke to subtly, but there's a wonderful book by Isabel Wilkerson, um, The Warmth of Other Songs. And she really talks about the great migration of African Americans from the South to the West to the east, um, um, to the north. And she really talked about the hopes, the dreams of African Americans migrating into urban areas, bringing their children, bringing their dreams and their hopes, and how they were really abandoned by those neighborhoods, by those cities, and the impact of that abandonment. And I think it's also profound, we, we, we slightly talked about gentrification just a bit, but the reality is that moving this conversation forward, the whims and notions and the movement of capital and racial um, prejudice really had a tremendous effect on African Americans. And now the movement of capital, particularly in this city and across this country, right? Because what really happened in Houston was that the market, the, the, the labor market, the economic markets and other city and housing markets got destabilized and Houston became a safe harbor or a place of refuge. And because of that, you had so many people coming to Houston for prosperity that they didn't have in other places. And African American communities have been disproportionately impacted by that. So what happened at Freeman's Town, what is happening in Third Ward, what is happening in Fifth Ward, what is happening in, in Second Ward, what's happening near Northside, what's happening in Independent Heights, is really because of a national pattern of movement of capital. And so African Americans now which I think is very ironic and very painful to me, but because we stayed in the neighborhoods that nobody else wanted, that nobody else cared about, and we made those neighborhoods places of our homes and our communities. And, and I, and I want to say this notion. You, you hear them talk a lot about the, the look of the neighborhood and the depression of the neighborhood. But when you ask third ward residents, you know, who have 10% have running water, have no running water, a fourth of them have mold that is noticeably in their home, a fourth of them have almost, a, half of them have pests, rats. But then you ask them, how satisfied are you living in third ward? And they say, 80% say we're very satisfied. And then you ask them a question, will your neighbor check your mail. 82% says yes. You say, will your neighbor watch your children? 79% say yes. Will your neighbor give you a ride? 83% says yes. That's called collective efficacy. So these neighborhoods which look to be depressed and deprived on the outside are really rich in strength and in collective efficacy. And so I think it's very ironic that this whole story moves to this moment. Now African Americans and Latinos are on the verge of losing the communities which nobody else wanted. And I think it's very profound to come to that realization now, all of these patterns now that people want these neighborhoods and need these neighborhoods and need housing. African Americans and the most fragile people in our cities are being washed away because capital again moves where it moves. I think that's a really great point. Um, and I think it, it plays into a lot of for this, this mode of who owns the buildings and who owns the neighborhood. Um, and I wanted to ask Steve, as a developer, and I know that you're, you develop more on the commercial side of things rather than the residential side, but I was wondering, um, you know, as you choose your projects and as you go about you know, producing your pro formas and your investment you know, statements, um, how do you choose the neighborhoods? And, and does the, do these issues of race and of you know, location-based sort of racial geographies, how does that affect the way that you, you produce your work? Um, it, it's a great question. And candidly, I, I think we're probably blind to everything when we develop in the sense that we're trying to pick urban areas that are surrounded by communities. And we view Houston to be a very inclusive place. Candidly, 
I'm, I'm after watching this movie, I'm going to do a lot more research because I feel like, you know, it's just jarring to see um, the studies and, and the results of uh, the policies from 1940s uh, and 50s. Um, what we try to do is we, we approach our communities in an urban acupuncture uh, setting. We try to find opportunities to find small pockets that we can restore in thoughtful ways where we're not changing the character of the area, but just enhancing it and providing more amenities. Um, I would say candidly, we are probably the most you know, inclusive in all of our developments. Uh, and, and I think that we, we don't, I mean, it, it, it just doesn't come in as a factor, right? Oh yeah, and just I don't know, but just to bring it back to this idea of what the relationship to Houston, I just wanted to point out, like when I first started making the film, I was very interested in interviewing George Mitchell, the career uh, developer of the and unfortunately he passed away as I was trying to negotiate sort of his interest in, in being in the film. And what the Woodlands was interesting about as a development is that it was an early sort of post-war suburb, well, a little bit late actually in the 70s, but and if someone, in the, I'm sure people in the audience probably know way more about this than me, but from my understanding, like he understood that white flight was pulling valuable tax base out of the inner city and his original plan was to use the woodlands as a tax funnel to bring money back into the city as a sort of like strange philanthropic thing. And I think it, it didn't quite end up working out the way that he'd hoped, but it's in this cruel irony that like the systems that pushed people out to the suburbs and white flight, you know, the, the circle of capitalism are now, are now bringing them back into the very same neighborhoods. And I just think like, um, <laughs> yes, this cool, vicious circle. And um, yeah, if anyone knows anything more about the woods. I, I have a question for the panel. Can we speak about the future of affordable living with this, uh, you know, uh, trend of uh, gentrification? Well, I, 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 I'd like to say that I think that in the film, the film talked about the lack of, I mean, the film talked about the way zoning perpetuated these um, segregated communities. I think that Houston has to tackle with the reality of what no zoning does, right? And I think that the, the challenge really is for me, and because this is a developer town, right? This city was built by developers. This city is a development town, right? And so that's part of like the psyche of Houstonians. And it's the psyche and we romanticize development and we romanticize it and we cleanse it of the consequences. So no one says, why can't can I go into third ward and, and buy a 5,000 square foot lot and be able to put three townhouses on it and be able to make this amount of profit? No one questions that, right? Because that's just being smart. That's being intelligent. That's being savvy. That's being in position. And so because we don't question those, those things, we have not put any protections in our neighborhoods to be able to protect the historic characters of our communities. And because we don't have zones we don't value historic structures and we don't value the structures which then speak to the culture and historical identity of neighborhoods and so Houstonians are going to have to really really struggle one with this idea that you don't have to give away the bank to be attractive to people, right? Because that's how Houstonians had to do with the swamps, it's hot, it's mosquitoes. So we're just happy anybody would want to date us. Anybody want to move here. We're just happy that they come, right? But we're no longer in that economic position. So how do you manage your new structural opportunity or reality? And being able to manage development is not anti-business, it's smart. It builds resiliency and sustainability. And so we we hope by having a community land trust, by being able to create a new policy mechanism that allows for us to create affordability. Because I want to say this, I know we need to move on. Listen, houses in my neighborhood go for $600,000. These are luxury shacks. I drive by these, and you look on the outside, and you're like, they just built that. It already needs to be painted, right? These are luxury shacks. They're overinflated. They do not have the value in which they are appraised at, right? And so having a mechanism that takes away that artificial inflation of the land value, which is not real. The land value is not real. It's based on a market and a demand, right? I hope the Community Land Trust is the beginning of a comprehensive set of policies to protect communities. We should have a flipping tax, right? We should, people
people should have to pay for flipping properties in our neighborhoods and destabilizing our neighborhoods. Right? That's, that, it could be if you don't hold the property for more than five years, you, you pay a tax for doing business at the expense of communities and neighborhoods. And so I'm saying those are the kind of policies of zone neighborhoods where you say we restrict demolitions. There's a moratorium on demolitions. Third Ward has the highest number of demolitions in the county, but the lowest rate of new bills for affordable housing. That's a neighborhood that's being destabilized by the market. And these are not people who are coming locally. These are people coming from Australia. I meet with developers who come from Australia. Australia because they've told that this is Houston is the place to be and that's not the kind of business we want to do in this city I, I would uh, just to piggyback on uh, Asada's power power uh, so the analogy in the in the movie was to uh, a rainforest right which has a multitude of types like of, of animals uh, another analogy might be keys on a piano right there's a lot of different keys in Houston, we have like two or three keys that we just hit over and over and over and over and over and over again. Okay, so we can we can explore many more different types of of, of chords and keys, and uh, one of those is the community land trust model that Asada is talking about, right? Where the the land is held in perpetuity, perhaps by a nonprofit, and then the 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 building that sits on the land. Uh, it might be owned uh, totally or in part by the individuals who live in it. And so they have some sense of ownership. They put, they put equity, they put their sweat into it. But when, uh, when they need to, when, when they leave, the value that it, it, of the land is captured and held stable by the community. So that is one very important set of keys that, that, is, being, that is being launched in Houston uh, as we speak, and very exciting uh, that that's happening. There are a whole bunch of other types of, of models that we should explore and different types of policy solutions. There are a whole set of policies built into Houston's codes that's called Chapter 42 in Houston City Ordinances. And you can go to uh, the city's website and look at the PDF and read this thing. And it, the code doesn't. Uh, claim to have a form. It doesn't claim to uh, have an impact that's racially uh, 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 differentiated. But embedded in, the, in that language, in that technical language, are all of these explosive effects. So for example, you look in, in it, at, at this code and it specifies how many parking spots are required, right? 1.33 for a one bedroom, 1.66 parking spots for a two bedroom. There's a certain number of parking spots that are required for uh, a psychiatric hospital, a different set of uh, parking requirements for uh, an inpatient. So it's, it's incredibly complicated in the city that's supposed to be um, open and uh, not heavily regulated. And those regulations apply all across the board. There's like basically a one size fits all for this entire region. And that imposes a really heavy cost on, on people like Steve. And it leads to uh, a, whole, a whole bunch of uh, vacancy, right? Because a lot of land has to be devoted to parking. It increases the cost of development. So we could look at those uh, codes and figure out ways to reduce the cost of building affordable housing, and um, you know, open up land uh, for you know housing and uh, people instead of automobiles. I, I mean, so there's many, many, many more keys. And Giorgio is an architect, <laughs> and we have an architecture school here. And part of the issue is a formal one, and the forms are like obfuscated and, and buried within these codes. I mean, to excavate them. Yeah, just as a way to just tie real quick these, the question and these couple of responses. I mean, the film for me was really an interrogation about the idea of values, right? Both the literal evaluation of how we apply value to homes, but also the cultural values. And for me, just speaking candidly about sort of going through this process and my feelings about the housing economy and your question about affordability, is that we have to find new mechanisms for creating a home ownership society that strips away 
the idea of using the home as a wealth accumulator That's right. to strip capital interest out of home so that it comes back to what I would say maybe the early intentionality of the, the early government uh, uh, sort of social contract was really about creating shelter and creating community and you know of course it would have its obvious problems as shown in the film but at its core was a was an idea about how to structure a society and then I think like moving forward until we figure out how to strip this commoditized idea out of housing it's always necessarily going to tease out some of the the more evil insidious sides of humanity one side being racism and the other side being you know really toxic loans or you know any numerous number of things that brought the housing crash down yeah, um, so since we have a pretty short time, I'd like to open it up to uh, some more questions in the audience. Uh, yes, we have a question over here, and if you could stand up. Yeah, no yeah. problem. <laughs> so I'm a native Chicagoan, and I've lived in Houston for 12 years. I moved here from England. I want to know, do you guys actually have the balls to do this right? So you talk about super city Chicago. Well, Chicago has done it wrong. I mean, it's a cesspool of racial segregation, especially with housing. I grew up with it. So Houston has this unique opportunity with its growth and its development to actually do it right, to actually put inclusion into the working model of building the city to this uh, bigger than Chicago third city. But do you guys have the balls to do it right? And are you actually going to develop with the intent of being inclusive <laughs> and giving people fair housing, not so much that they can actually have one or two, three, apartments in a luxury condo but that their kid can go to that school and their parents can feel safe that their kid is not going to be ostracized because they have black skin can we do this right uh, I mean, just to piggyback on that question I, I, and I add to the question so after Harvey right we have this uh, refigured landscape uh, where we're not only at risk for the gentrification we're already familiar with we're at risk for sort of green gentrification the, and the uh, sort of increased valuation of land that did not flood and the loss of value uh, uh, for, for land that does flood. In addition, we have the legacy of um, environmental injustices. Uh, we have communities of color, especially where landfills, factories, um, uh, all kinds of um, toxic things have been cited in those in those neighborhoods so there's there's so many layers but after Harvey we've gotten this once in a generation uh, infusion of money from the federal government the city of Houston is receiving 1.15 billion dollars from uh, from HUD and the county which now has a new leadership um, is receiving another $1.15 billion. That is huge, that's more money than the city of Houston's uh, Community and Housing Development Department has gotten from the federal government in the entire history of that department, right? And they, and they only have a certain number of years to spend it. So um, what that is going to do is possibly, I, I think it's going to challenge all of us to rise above uh, this history, it's not history, it's, this is our living history. This is the kind of thing that that's still going on, right? But how are we going to spend $2.3 billion to build housing for affordable people in this city? Where are we going to build it, right? Whose neighborhoods are going to have these? Are, are black communities also going to accept? Every community has a NIMBY movement, right? white communities, black communities, are you going to work so that you and your neighbors accept that plan development that includes 20, 30, 40% uh, mix of people who um, make below the median income and a portion of them use uh, Section 8 vouchers and some of them are, are disabled veterans. Are you going to talk to your neighbors about that? And, and I want to add, I, I am 
I am honored to be the chair of what's known as the Emancipation Economic Development Council, which started through a partnership of an art organization, Project World Houses at MIT. And that partnership brought together architects, developers, um, you know, attorneys, uh, researchers, um, faith-based community, business owners, and we really put together a comprehensive plan for preserving, protecting, and revitalizing the historic Third Ward, which is where the Community Land Trust idea was really championed locally here in Houston and pushed um, to the city level. And so I say that to say that, you know, I, I said that to say this, what is going to happen in Houston will be what Houstonians decide they want to happen. We live in a city where we do not participate civically in our city government. And I know we don't participate civically because when you have a weak government, and, and I appreciate Mayor Turner, I'm a fan. When you have a weak political apparatus, we have a weak political apparatus because we don't have zoning. We don't regulate and have strong policies. And so you can make a lot of money and you can make a lot of moves and not deal with the local political establishment, right? But until people get organized to act for more policies and not programs. Programs are temporal. They don't, they don't rearrange structural conditions and bring resources down. Policies are what remake cities and really determine city patterns, right? And until we stop romanticizing Houston strong, we so diverse, until we really look ourselves in the mirror and say, what kind of city are we becoming? What kind of city are we? And until we get engaged at all levels, every community knows knows what it wants and knows what it needs. Until we organize ourselves in our neighborhoods, create neighborhood-based planning, use that planning to really create agendas for city council and city and the county, then we, what we will become will be a reaction to all the dynamics of markets. And so I think we have an opportunity. And I say to you, oh, we're going to get it right. You're a historian. You live in here. Will you get it right? I, I, all I can say is that either people get involved, and I'm telling you, I'm exhausted. You heard all the stuff that I do. I'm exhausted, but it matters so much, I'm willing to exhaust myself to get it done. And so I want to ask people, do you, I mean, it's nice to go and give somebody some food and be like, ah, you know, from the disaster, the hurricane, we was there, we were strong. It's another thing to go stay on the battlefield day in and day out, to move this city progressively forward through policies, and policies which dictate how money is spent and how development is managed and how opportunities are distributed throughout this city. We can do it. We have history. We got Chicago. We got Brooklyn. We got L.A. We got plenty of case studies of who got it wrong to know how to get it right. We've we got a question. We've got a question in the back. It just started. Okay. <laughs> and the second thing is, just from my own curiosity, do y'all think in Houston, in the majority opinion that the Ashby High Rise was definitely a not in my backyard thing, or was it actually too high, or does anybody, like, I'm just yeah. curious. <laughs> Steve, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, I, mean, I, yeah, I, I absolutely think that it was because of where it was located that it was stopped, I mean, can we? Because of the you know the power of the neighborhood there, and just to be honest, um, I, I think that what you're seeing is in the historic areas uh, there are overlays now where we are restricting the number of or the minimum lot size to avoid the destruction of some historic structures in exchange for just you know a six pack of townhomes, which is sort of the, the Houston standard. Yeah, but that's based on home ownership. So I live in a neighborhood that's 78 percent renters, and Chapter 42 is based on again property ownership. So, I mean, we've lived in this neighborhood, you know, for 
since since the 1800s and 1900s and so we don't get to determine what comes in our neighborhood right because we are renters right and there's this strong discrimination against renters and in fact when we created our civic club the only civic club that's renter based we were told by the city by our city government that it was in the bylaws that renters couldn't be part of civic associations right so you know so i just want to say even chapter 42 is limited and and i think actually how rise is irony and karma right because see people people don't want so as long as other people build this stuff and other people neighbors they're like well you know you should really and this is development town right until it's in your neighborhood when you're getting the townhouses then everybody wants to get upset when Freeman's town was getting demolished and taken over and, and destroyed nobody cared but when it comes into and so I think that's the irony and until we realize that those townhouses are opportunities that are coming across the city and that bad construction, poor building, low quality material, that is a problem for all neighborhoods. And so I think, and Ashley only got lucky because the residents didn't win that battle. What they got lucky was the energy market tanked. And when the energy market tanked, then we had a flood of high end, you know, real estate apartments. But now that that's over, I'm certain that that development is on track because now building is necessary again in the city. So they didn't win because they didn't have any legal guidelines to win on. And, yeah, just, and just as a quick sort of over, just overarching comment is that like, I think another thing that I hope you come away from seeing the film is that, you know, the way the city's looked didn't happen by accident. It took a great deal of the heavy hand of not just the government, but then the system that the government creates and that, you know, the system that people exploit as, and I don't mean that in a pejorative sense, but just in the, as, as developers, as house flippers, they're operating within a system that basically propagates this really terrible system as far as I'm concerned. What we have to become more comfortable with, and I'm sure a lot of people here are starting to like throw down their seats because it's uncomfortable to talk about this, is that it will take an equal amount of heavy handedness to fix these problems. And so we have to just become more comfortable with the idea of, of telling NIMBYs, you know, like, I don't know, some, how that gets fixed, I don't know, but my, the point of making the film was at least to like, start that conversation so that we all have a shared history and we're not like uh, deluding ourselves about a myth. Um, Rob, yes, you can have just a, a short little period, but we have time just for one more question after Rob's comment. No, take the question now. Okay. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll take a question. Uh, yes, right here. Yes, uh, and if you could yeah. stand up. Uh, okay. Um, so that we can make uh, I just wanted to kind of ask you a question about no zoning in Houston, um, because I've been looking into maybe buying somewhere, and what I've realized is that there's a lot of deed restrictions and HOAs. So while we are no zoning, there's a lot of rules that decide you know, what, how you can use that land and who, you know, how you can develop it, how many parking spaces you would need if you ever were to, yeah. So that's that's my question as far as like these neighborhoods that have been gentrified really quickly. Is it because there's there's less deed de de restrictions and HOAs, and is that kind of like a self organization that can happen, uh, that isn't happening in these happening in these uh, communities, and perhaps why is this not happening? Because they're mostly that's right there you go <laughs> and if you go back to the film because historically there were barriers to home ownership right so when you say well why didn't they buy or why haven't they bought right so then I hope and, and I and I think I think part of this is us this is a hard thing because this is a it's a it's an American idea right so we judge people really based on the accumulation of these assets we do right we tell our children you should buy have you bought yet you know like like you know what I'm saying we we see our friends and we say this is a nice house oh it's so lovely oh right and so I think that I I, I don't want to romanticize it but as individuals I had to choose with a PhD to move back to a 500 square foot house in a neighborhood with all of those issues and say I did I defy you to tell me I'm not a success in my life with a PhD living in 500 square foot right right I had to tease away that notion to run my family my friends or anybody else that you could describe my success based on what I own 
I'm a renter today. And I'm okay with being a renter. I'm not less active. I'm not less engaged. I'm not less valuable. So part of that is making these decisions and then asking myself, and I want to say this because this is a majority white audience, and I really want to say this. I don't care who moves into the historic third ward. I have no problem with who moves in. I only have a problem when people move in and don't respect the fact that I live in an African-American community that's based on the history and culture of African-Americans, and that's a prominent identity of my neighborhood. That's the only time I have a problem. So when people move in and they don't want TSU to rehearse at night, they've been rehearsing since I've been a child, and they move in and don't like the clubs on, on Emancipation Avenue and, 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 and Alameda, I got a problem with that. You know, I have a problem when you move into my neighborhood and you decide what is part of my history and culture is something that is less than, and you have to name it a new part of town, near near Midtown. You know what I'm saying? That is the problem that, that have African-Americans have always been welcoming. We moved into Third War because we thought the Jewish community would welcome us in and would understand our plight. We got left there because people thought we were the problem, and they moved and found new problems. And so I just want to say this idea of where you live, move to a place where you can love that place as it is and want to be part of that neighborhood because of what it is today and you're going to seed into that tomorrow. I just want to uh, jump on top of keep going with that. And the, I think the big challenge is to leave this room feeling optimistic. Yes. Right? A lot to you got to leave this room imagining the future that you want. Yeah. Right? You need to visualize that future, and then you need to ask Giorgio to make a movie that helps <laughs> you see it. Join right? your civic club. Join your civic yeah. club. So what is it going to look like? What Asada is telling you is she's not looking back. She's not romanticizing. She doesn't have a nostalgic vision for what the Third Ward was. She doesn't want to turn the clock back and freeze the Third Ward in time. She's looking forward, right? You need to look. We all need to look forward. And I'm sorry, Steve didn't get a lot of time to talk, but he has to be at the table. Yeah. And he needs to be able to make some money while helping us make that optimistic future that you imagine happen. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'm sorry we don't have any questions.